Live from Midtown Manhattan, it's theCUBE. Covering Big Data New York City 2017. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media and its ecosystem sponsors. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in New York City for Big Data NYC, our annual event with SiliconANGLE Media, The Cube, and Wikibon in conjunction with Strata Hadoop, which is now called Strata Data as that show evolves. I'm John Furrier, co-host of The Cube with Peter Burris, head of research for SiliconANGLE Media and general manager of Wikibon. Our next two guests are two legends in the big data industry, Rob Beard, the CEO of Hortonworks, really one of the founders of the big data movement. You know, get Cloudera and Hortonworks, really kind of built that out. And Rob Thomas, general manager of IBM Analytics, Big time investments they've made, both of them. Congratulations for your success, guys. Welcome back to theCUBE, great to see you guys. Great to great. see you guys. And got an exciting partnership yeah. to talk about yeah. as well. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so, but let's do a little history. You guys, obviously we're going to get, I want to get to that and get clarify on the news in, in a second, but you guys have been there from the beginning, kind of looking at the market, developing it, almost from the embryonic state to now. I mean, what a changeover. Give a quick comparison of where we've come from and what's the current landscape now, because you have, it evolved into so much more. You got IOT, you got AI, you got a lot of things in the enterprise, you got cloud computing, a lot of, a lot of tailwinds for this industry. It's gotten bigger, it's become big and now it's huge. What's your thoughts, guys? You know, I, so you look at the arc since really all this started with Hadoop and Rob and I met early in the days of that. You've kind of gone from the early few years was about optimizing operations. Hadoop is a great way for a company to become more efficient, take out cost in their data infrastructure. And so that put huge momentum into this area. And now we've kind of fast forwarded to the point where now it's about, so how am I going to actually extract insight? So instead of just getting operational advantages, how am I going to get competitive advantage? And that's about bringing the world of data science and machine learning, run it natively on Hadoop. That's the next chapter, and that's what Rob and I are working closely together on. Rob, your thoughts too, uh, you know, we've been talking about data in motion, you guys were early on on that, seeing that trend. Real time is still hot, data is still the core asset people are trying to figure out and you know, move from wrangling to actually enabling that data. Right, well, you know, in the early days of big data, it was, a, to, to Rob's point, it was very much about bringing operational leverage and efficiency and being able to aggregate very siloed data sets uh, and unlocking that data and bringing it into a, into a central platform. In the early days and resources um, in, in Hadoop went to making Hadoop an enterprise viable data platform with security, governance, operations management capability that mirrored any of the uh, proprietary transactional or EDW platforms. And what, what the lessons learned in that were um, is that by bringing all that data together in a, in a central data set, we now can understand what's happening with our customers and, and with our other assets pre-transaction. And so we can be, they could become very prescriptive in engaging in yeah. new business models. And so what we've learned now is the further upstream we can get in the world of IoT and bring that data under management from the point of origination and be able to manage that all the way through its life cycle, we can create new business models with higher velocity of engagement and a lot more uh, rapid value that gets created. It though creates a number of new challenges in all the areas of how you secure yeah. that g data, how you, how you bring governance across that entire life cycle from a common stream set. Well let's talk about the news you guys have, you're obviously the partnership. Partners, partnerships become the new normal in an open source era that we're living in. You're seeing open source software grow really exponentially in the forecast coming in next five years and, and 10 years in exponential growth in new code. Just new people coming on board, new developers, DevOps is mainstream. Partnerships are key for communities. I mean, 90% of the code is going to be open source, 10%, uh, as they say, the code sandwich, as Jim Zemlin, the executive director at Linux Foundation, points to, and you're seeing that work. You guys have worked together with uh, Apache Atlas. What's the news, what's the relationship with Hortonworks and IBM? Share, share the news. So uh, a lot of great work's been happening there uh, in generally in the open source community around Apache Atlas and, and making sure that we're bringing mission critical governance capabilities across the big data sets and, and, and environments. Um, and as we then get into the complexity of now multiple data lakes, multiple tiers of data coming from multiple sources, that, that brings a higher level of requirement in both the security and governance aspects. And that's where the partnership with IBM is, is continuing to drive 
Apache Atlas into, into mission critical enterprise viability. But then when we get into the distributed models and enterprise requirements, uh, the IBM platforms leveraging Atlas yeah. and, and the work we're doing together, then take that into the to the mission critical enterprise. So you got the open source, and I got the enterprise. Right, we've talked many times about the enterprise is a hard hard environment to crack for say a startup. But even now they're they're becoming reliant on open source, but yet they have a lot of operational challenges. How does this relate to the challenge of you know CIO and his staff of now new personas coming in? You're seeing the data science role you've seen expanding, you know, from analytics to you know DevOps. Yep. They have challenges. Look, enterprises are getting better at this. Clearly we've seen progress in the last five years on that. But to kind of go back and link the points, there's a phrase I heard I like. It says there's no AI without IA, meaning inf information architecture. Fundamentally what our partnership is about is delivering the right information architecture. So it's Hadoop federated with whatever you have in terms of warehouses and databases. We partner around IBM Common SQL for that. It's metadata for your core governance because without governance, you're not, you don't have compliance, you can't offer self-service analytics. So we are forming the, what I would call the fluid data layer for an enterprise that enables them to get to this future of AI. And my view is there's a, there's a stop in between, mm -hmm. which is data science, machine learning, you know, applications that are ready today that clients can put into production and improve the outcomes they're getting. That's what we're focused on right now, is how do we take the information architecture we've been able to establish yes. and then help clients on this journey? That's what enterprises want, because that's how they're going to build differentiation in their businesses. But the definition of an information architecture is closest to applications, and maybe this is, informs your perspective, it's close to the applications that the business is running on. It goes back to your observation about we used to be focusing on optimizing operations. As you move away from those applications, your information architecture becomes increasingly diffuse. It's not as crystal clear. It's not. How do you drive that clarity as the data moves to derived new applications? So I think we're, and Rob and I have talked about this, I think we're at the dawn of probably a new era in application development. Much more agile, flexible applications that are taking advantage of data mm -hmm wherever it resides. We are really early in that. So right now we're in the, let's actually put into practice machine learning and data science, let's extract value of the data we got. That will then inform a new set of applications, which is related to the announcements that Hortonworks made this week around data plane, which is looking at multi-cloud environments and how, how would you manage applications and data across those? Rob, you can speak to that better than I can, I think. Well, the data plane thing, I want to just get that second. This information architecture, I think you're 100% right on. The data that we're hearing from customers in the enterprises, they see the IoT buzz, oh, of course they're going to connect IoT devices down the road. But when they see the security challenges, right, when they see um, the operational challenges around hiring people <laughs> to actually run the DevOps, they have to then re architect. So there's certainly a conversation that we see on what is the architecture for the data, but also a little bit bigger than that, the holistic architecture of, of say cloud. So a lot of people are like trying to clean up their house, if you will, right. to be ready for this new era. And I think Wikibon's, your private cloud report, you guys put out really amplify that by saying, yeah, they see these trends, but they got to kind of get, get, get their act together, right? They got to look at who the staff is, what the data architecture is going to be, what apps are being developed. So doing a lot more retrenching. Um, and how does, so give, given that, if we agree, what does that mean for the data plane and then your, your vision of having that data architecture so that this will be a solid foundational transition? So I think, I think we all hit on the, the, the same point, which is uh, it is about enabling a next generation IT architecture of which the, the sort of the X and the Y axis are network and data. And generally what big data has been able to do and Hadoop specifically was you know, over the last five years, enabling the existing applications architected, and I, I like the term that's been coined uh, by you, is they were known processes with known technology. Um, and that's how you know, applications in the last 20 years have been yeah. enabled. Big data and Hadoop generally have unlocked that ability to now be able to, to, to move all the way out to the edge and, and incorporate IoT, data at rest, data in motion, on-prem, and cloud for hybrid architecture. What that's done is, it said, now we know uh, how 
to build an application that takes advantage of an event or an occurrence and then can drive the outcome in a variety of ways. We don't have to wait for you know, a static programming model to automate a function. And in fact, if we are wait, we're going to fail. And I think <laughs> right. that's one of the biggest challenges. I mean, IBM, I, I will tell you guys, or I'll, I'll tell you, Rob, that the, uh, one of the craziest days I've ever spent is I flew from Japan to New York City for the IBM information architecture announcement back in like 1994. <laughs> and it was the most painful two days I've ever experienced <laughs> in my entire life. That's a long time ago, it's ancient history. We can't use information architecture as a way of slowing things down. Right. What we need to be able to do is we need to introduce technology that again allows the clarity of information architecture close to these core applications to move. And that it may involve things like machine learning itself being embedded directly into how we envision data being moved, how we envision optimization, how we envision the data plane working. Mm -hmm. So as you guys think about this data plane, it ends, we, everybody ends up asking themselves, is there a natural place for data to be? What's going to be centralized? What's going to be decentralized? And I'm asking you, is increasingly the data going to be decentralized, but the governance and securities and policies that we put in place going to be centralized, and that's what's going to inform the operation of the data plane? What do you guys think? You know, it, it, it's our view very specifically from a Hortonworks perspective that we want to give the ability for the data to exist and, and reside wherever the physics dictate, whether that be on-prem, whether that be on, in the cloud. And we want to give the ability to process and take action on an event or an occurrence or drive an outcome as early in the cycle as possible. So Define that what you mean by early in the cycle. Okay. From, so as we see conditions emerge, a machine part okay. breaking down, right? Okay. Um, a customer taking an action, a supply chain inventory so outage. So as close as possible to the event that's generating the data. As it's being generated, it. or as the processes are leading up to the natural outcome, and we can maybe disintermediate for a better outcome. And so that means that we have to be able to engage with the data irrespective of where it is in its cycle, right? And that's where we want to, we've, we've enabled with data plane the ability to abstract out the requirement of where that data is and to be able to have a common plane, pun intended, for the, the operations and managing and provisioning of the environment for being able to govern that and secure it, which are increasingly becoming intertwined because you have to deal with it from point of origin through point at rest. Is but but this is what the, so the There's a new phrase, the single plane of glass, um, <laughs> as, the, as customer, the, 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 all joking aside, I want to just get your thoughts on this, Rob, too. Customers, what's in it for me? I'm the customer. Right now I have a couple challenges. That's what we hear from, from the market. I have data, I need data consistency because things are happening in real time, whatever events are going on with data, we know more data's going to be coming off from the edge and everywhere else faster and more, and more volume. So I need consistency of my data and I don't want to have multiple data silos. And then I got to integrate the data. So on the application developer side, a DevOps-like ethos is emerging where, hey, if this data being done, I need to integrate that into my app in real time. So those are two challenges. Mm -hmm. Does the data plane address that concern for customers? That, that's the question. Uh, it, it's it's emerging to the DevOps world. To the, to the it, it, today it enables the ops world. And so I can integrate my apps into the data plane. My apps and my uh, my uh, my other data assets, irrespective of where they reside, on prem, cloud, or out to the edge, and all points in between. Rob, for enterprise, is this going to be the single pane of glass for data governance? Is that how the vision that you guys see this? Because that's a benefit, if that could happen, right? I, right. Mean, I mean, that's essentially one step towards the, the, the promised land, if you will, for more data you know, flowing through apps and app developers. So let me, let me reshape a little bit. There's two main problems that collectively we have to address for enterprises. One is they want to apply machine learning and data science at scale, and they're struggling with that and two is they want to get to cloud. And it's not talked about nearly enough, but most clients are really struggling with that. And so then you fast forward on that one, we are moving to a multi-cloud world. Absolutely. I don't think any enterprise is going to standardize on a single cloud, that's pretty clear. So you need things like data plane that acknowledge it's a multi-cloud world, mm -hmm. and even as you move to multi-clouds, yeah. you want a single 
focus for your data governance, a single strategy for your data governance. And then what we're doing together with IBM Data Science Experience with Hortonworks is say, whatever data you have in there, you can now do your machine learning right where that data is. You don't need to move it around. You can if you want, but you don't have to move it around because it's built in and it's integrated right into the Hadoop ecosystem. That solves the two main enterprise pain points, which is help me get the cloud, help me apply data science and machine learning. Well, we'll have to follow up. I'd love to do just a segment just on that. I think multi-cloud is clearly the direction, but what the hell does that mean? I'm, if I run 365 on Azure, that's one app. If I run something else on Amazon, is that that's multiple clouds, but there's not necessarily moving workloads across. So the question I want to ask here is, it's clear from customers they want single code bases that run on all clouds seamlessly, so I don't have to skill up on things on Amazon, Azure, and Google. Not all clouds are created equal on how they do things. Right. Storage through ever, all the new, all the inside the data factories of how they process. That's a challenge. How do you guys see that playing out? That you know you have on-premise activities that have been bootstrapped, now you have multiple clouds with different ways of doing things from pipelining, ingestion, and processing, and, and yeah. learning. How do you see that playing out? Well, it, it, Clouds it, just kind of standardizing around <laughs> data plane? I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, but it, 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 and there's also the complexity of even within the multi-clouds, you're going to have multiple tiers within the clouds. Right? If you're running in one data center in Asia versus another one in Latin America, and a, you know, maybe a couple across the Americas. But does a, as a customer, do I need to know the cloud internals of Amazon, Azure, and Google? Today you do. In, in a standalone world, yes you do. And that's yeah. that's where we have to bring and, and abstract the complexity of that out. And that's the that's the goal of data plane, uh, is to be able to abstract whether it's on, which tier it's in, on-prem, or whether it's on yeah. irrespective of which cloud platform. But, but Rob, Rob Thomas, I, I really like the way you put it. Um, there, there may be some other issues that users have to worry about, certainly there's some that we think, but the but the two questions of where am I going to run the machine learning and how am I going to get that to the cloud appropriately, I really like the way you put that. At the end of the day, what users need to focus on is less where the application code is and more where the data is so that they can move the application code or they can move the work to the data. That's fundamentally the perspective. We think that, we think that businesses don't take their business to the cloud, they bring the cloud to their business. Right. And so when you think about this notion of uh, increasingly uh, looking at a set of work that needs to be performed, where the data exists, and what acts you're going to take in that data, it does suggest that data is going to become more of a centerpiece asset within the business. How does some of the things that you guys are doing lead customers to start to acknowledge data as an asset so they're making the appropriate investments in their data as their business evolves and partly in response to data as an asset. What do you think? So we have to do our job to build to common denominators and that's what we're doing to make this easy for clients. So today we announced the IBM integrated analytics system, same code base on private cloud as on a hardware system, as on public cloud. All of it federates to Hortonworks through Common SQL, that's what clients need because it solves their problem. Click of a button, they can get the cloud. And by the way, on private cloud, it's based on Kubernetes, which is aligned with what we have on public cloud. We're working with Hortonworks to optimize Yarn and Kubernetes working together. Like these are the meaty issues that if we don't solve it, then clients have to deal with the bag of bolts. And so that's the kind of stuff we're solving together. So think about it, one single code base for managing your data, federates to Hadoop, Machine learning is built into the system and it's based on Kubernetes. I mean, that's what clients want. Yeah, and, and the containers is just great too, Kubernetes. Yep. Great cloud native trend. You guys have been great active in there. Congratulations to both of you guys. Final uh, question gets to get you guys the last word. How does the relationship between Hortonworks and IBM evolve? How do you guys see this playing out? Uh, more, more of the same, keep integrating in code. Is there any new things you see on the horizon that you're going to be knocking down in the future? Yeah. I'll take the first shot. Um, the goal is to continue to make it simple and easy for the customer to get to the cloud, bring those machine learning and data science models to the data, and make it easy for the consumption of, of the new next generation of applications. And uh, you know, continue to make our customers successful and drive value, but to do it through transparently enabling the, the technology platforms together. And I think we've, we've acknowledged uh, the things that IBM is extraordinarily good at the things that Hortonworks good at and bringing those two together with virtually no overlap. And, and Rob, you've been very partner-centric. Your thoughts on this partnership? Look, it's 
what clients want. The since we announced this, the results. I mean, the response has been fantastic, yeah. and I think it's for one simple reason. So Hortonworks' mission, we all know, is open source and delivering in the community. They do a fantastic job of that. We also know that sometimes clients need a little bit more. And so when you bring those two things together, that's what clients want. That's very different than what other people in the industry do that say, we're going to create a proprietary wrapper around your Hadoop environment and lock your data in. That's the opposite of what we're doing. We're saying we're giving you full freedom of open source, but we're enabling you to augment that with machine learning, data science capabilities. This is what clients want, that's why the partnership's working, and that's why that we've gotten the response we have. And you guys have been multiple years into the new operating model of being much more aggressive in the big data community, which has now morphed into a much larger landscape. Are you pleased with some of the results you're seeing on the IBM side and, the, and, the, and more coding, more involvement in these projects on your end? Yeah, I mean look, we were certainly early on Spark, created a lot of momentum there. I think it's actually ended up helping both of our, our interests in the market. We've built a huge community of developers in IBM, which is not something IBM had even a few years ago. Um, but it's great to have a relationship like this where we can continue to augment our skills. We make each other better. And I think what you'll see in the future is more on the governance side. I think that's the piece that's still not quite been figured out by most enterprises yet. The need is understood. The implementation is slow, so you'll see more from us collectively there. Well, congratulations, and the community work you guys have done. I think the community's will models evolving mainstream as well. Open source continue to grow. Congratulations. Rob Bearden and Rob Thomas here inside theCUBE. More coverage here in Big Data NYC with theCUBE after this short break. <laughs>